Guys, wanted to make a few announcements. Please keep the aisles free at all times for your own safety. Put your mobile phones on silent mode or switch off when the session is on. And do not leave any bag unattended. Festival is not responsible for your bags or anything that you lose. Also, let's keep the place clean. Do not litter. We've got dustbins all over. Please use them. Also, we have something very, you know, at the Jaipur music stage, we have at Hotel Clark Samer, we have some interesting sessions there. Today at 5 p.m., we have the classical session and evening with the masters, the past present and the future of Indian classical tradition. We've got L. Subramaniam Kavita Krishnamurti and Shekhar Rajiani in conversation with Sartha Kaushik. And after that, we have L. Subramaniam playing at 7 p.m. and Medieval Pandits at 8.30 p.m. You can grab your tickets from bookmyshow.com or from tent number two outside.
request all of you please keep the aisles free move on to the sides it's for your own safety we need to keep this is the only entry and exit to darbar hall we need to leave this completely free i request you all i mean you can come in front right over here but please do not block the entry quick reminder again do not reserve seats for anyone keep your mobile phones on silent keep the aisles free and also please tweet zjlf 2019 or tag at the rate zjlf Good morning ladies and gentlemen welcome to the 12th Jaipur 12th Z Jaipur Literature Festival we are here at Darbar Hall and we have the coming of the third rise please welcome Richard Evans introduced by Simon Sebag Montefiore um ladies and gentlemen you have a real treat today professor sir richard evans uh one of the most distinguished um historians of the third reich um author of the third reich trilogy most recently a, a history of europe next a biography of hobsborn he says he's retired but um if that's his, if that's his retirement it's, he's he's actually more industrious than ever and um and it's going to be a, a wonderful session so can i introduce you to richard evans Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here in the world's largest democracy. But uh, democracy is under threat in many parts of the world. There is the phenomenon of populism of strong men who claim to have a direct line to what they call the popular will, bypassing legislatures, ignoring constitutional uh, arrangements. and establishing dictatorships we can can you hear we can see this in we can see uh, the the uh, rise of strong men of authoritarian leaders the weakening of democracy and in some places the collapse of democracy in many parts of the world today we can see it in hungary with viktor orban we can see it in poland uh, we can see it in turkey with erdogan Uh, we can see it in uh, parts of the uh, of, of Latin America in Nicaragua uh, in Venezuela we can see it in the Philippines uh the uh, president of the United States would like to uh do this in America but although he clearly has a contempt for uh constitutional arrangements for uh, the desire to uh, become a, a strong man so far the American constitution has stood in his way but the weakening of democracy is uh, a general worldwide phenomenon above all without <clears throat> wishing to reduce it to economic factors clearly in the wake of the uh, 2008 financial crash uh, and then uh, facilitated i believe by the rise of social media and the internet uh, which uh, have, have, i think have been useful tools in the hands of some uh, uh, some would be and real uh, politicians who wish to become strong men now we're looking history obviously everywhere uh, for examples we try and learn from history remember santiana's famous statement that those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it 
So what I want to do today is to talk about the most dramatic uh, and in some, time, some ways the most fateful uh, example of the collapse of a functioning democracy. That is to say, the collapse of the Weimar Republic in Germany in 1933 and the coming to power within an extremely short space of time, within about six months in 1933, of Adolf Hitler and the German National Socialist Workers' Party, known generally as the Nazis. Now, I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm just going to raise my hand like that when I want the first slide to come up and, and hope that it actually, actually does. All right. Okay, if not, I'll just talk without. I'll just talk without. So, there we go. Slide, please. No. Is anything happening? It's not working? No? Okay. Well, we'll sort of dispense with the PowerPoint then, all right? Um, so, what I want to do is to look at the... Uh, uh, what I've, got a, I've got a screen down here, uh, which I presume will have the slides up on it if they materialize. But in the meantime, I'll start talking. So, what I'm going to do is give you a kind of rough chronological run through. How does a democracy collapse? How does a dictatorship arise? We've got a slide here. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Now, this is, uh, you can see, this is the crowd in Munich, in the main square of Munich, in 1914, the 1st of August, which are, uh, the, all the masses of people there are celebrating the outbreak of World War I. And it's a photograph taken by Heinrich Hoffmann, who was Hitler's personal uh, photographer, and Hitler said, oh, that's interesting, I was there. And you can see him pointing himself out, and there he is in the crowd, his face beaming with enthusiasm. Uh, and <clears throat> obviously you have to start the, any, any account of the rise and triumph of Nazism with the figure of Adolf Hitler. He was, of course, not German. He was an outsider. He was born in Austria in 1889, but from the start, as a German-speaking Austrian, when he grew up uh, in his adolescence already, he was uh, a German nationalist. He believed German-speaking Austria, which was part of the multinational, multicultural Habsburg monarchy, including Hungarians, Yugoslavs, and so on, uh, should become part of a uh, united Germany. So in 1914, he was already in Munich, had gone to Germany, and he volunteered for the German army. And surprising though it may be, German bureaucracy wasn't terribly efficient, so nobody noticed he was Austrian. Uh, they just signed him up. Uh, this is what gave Hitler, this a, came from obscure origins. His father was a minor Austrian customs official. Uh, he was not particularly well educated. He tried to be an artist, but he'd been rejected from the Vienna Academy. You can see uh, some of his paintings. They're not terribly good. Even worse ones are passing around uh, forgeries because they fetch a bit of money, not because of their quality, but because of his, uh, who, who painted them. And he uh, lived a, a kind of life of a drifter before World War I, even sleeping in uh, DOS houses, uh, selling postcards that he painted on the streets. Uh, didn't have a job, never really worked. And the war service in the German army gave him meaning. It gave him, gave his life a meaning. He became a radical German nationalist. He won the Iron Cross, first class. Uh, even um, uh, remarkably uh, recommended by a Jewish officer. But at the end of the war, he uh, became a radical anti-Semite. He believed along with some others on the far right in Germany, that the Jews in Germany, a tiny minority, uh, less, than, uh, less than 2% of the population, only about half a million of them, that they had somehow fomented revolution, stabbed the German army uh, in the back. There was a revolution when Germany was defeated. The Kaiser was forced to abdicate. A constituent assembly met at the town of Weimar, because Berlin was too dangerous, there were riots and uh, battles going on. And, he, um, and, and uh, the, the new regime, the new democratic regime, uh, had to sign a humiliating peace agreement with the Americans, British and the French, uh, 
uh, which took away uh, about 13% of Germany's territory, uh, a lot of its res industrial resources, limited the German army to 100,000 men. Uh, it uh, banned combat planes from being manufactured or deployed. It banned uh, battleships and all other kinds of offensive naval weapons and imposed a huge bill of reparations for the damage the Germans had caused in occupying northeastern France and Belgium for four and a half years. Now, let's see if we can get the next slide. Okay, here's Hitler on the right. As you see, his moustache had not yet assumed its final toothbrush shape in the army, uh, looking very, very proud of himself. Uh, so, uh, so, the next slide. Now, this is a map. Sorry, it's in German, but it's pretty clear. Blue, the blue is the Weimar Republic with, uh, in, the, in the south there, there's green bits and other colored bits in the borders uh, of uh, states, particularly the green is Bavaria. So uh, the bits taken away are the Polish corridor on the right uh, and um, parts of the borders of Denmark and Alsace-Lorraine in, in the left. It's a smaller, truncated uh, version. Hitler, uh, along with some others, uh, was sent by the army to observe a new far-right counter-revolutionary party that had emerged in the wake of the defeat of a socialist revolution in Bavaria. And he began speaking at it. It soon became clear he was a gifted public orator. And in due course, he became, uh, let's have the next one, he became the, the leader. This is a very violent time in Germany. Uh, there, there are street fights in the early 1920s, especially 1919 to 1920, again in 1923. This is actually a captured British tank. But this is what was going on in the streets of Berlin. So it's a very violent period. Hundreds are killed in clashes in Munich. And that was the atmosphere of violence in which Hitler came into politics, founded, uh, changed his uh, little party, joined into the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The aim of it <coughs> was to uh, set up an ultra-nationalist dictatorship to reverse the Treaty of Versailles, to get back the lost territories, to end reputation, reparations, and then beyond that to expand Germany, take up the legacy of World War I again, and uh, to use a phrase, make Germany great again. So let's have the next slide. Uh, there he is uh, in a sort of trench coat in the early 1920s, the next slide. Um, and that's a cartoon, a contemporary car cartoon. It says terms that the French general there, Foch, is offering to the German people. German people must pay for all damage to civilians on land and sea uh, and from the air. Uh, cause, the next slide, cause of a great, uh, great many problems. So the Weimar Republic established itself as a, a democracy, a true democracy in many ways. It had universal adult suffrage, so women could vote for the first time in Germany. It elected a, a parliament, a national parliament, uh, which uh, formed governments. Uh, it was a federal system, so there were federated states, which also had controlled their own, at least their own domestic affairs, or most of them. Uh, and uh, elections were held under a system of proportional representation. That is to say, you voted for a party, and then according to how many votes the party got, then they got so many seats in the legislature. Now, uh, this um, republic uh, was pretty, in, in some ways, pretty unstable. So you can see that, for example, the governments last on average only a few months. There are 15 governments between 1919 and 1933. Um, but it's slightly deceptive. Every government was a coalition government, actually not because of proportional representation, but because Germany was divided in many ways by religion, Protestant and Catholic. Catholics, about 40% of the population, slightly less. Um, divided by class, a very strong working class. That voted. Catholics had their own party. The working class divided into the communists and the socialists. The middle classes were liberals and nationalists. Um, the other classes voted for the 
the, the, the moderate or fairly moderate right. It was divided in many ways. And so every government was a coalition government. But these divisions had been there before 1914 uh, uh, and were not the creation, not even uh, made worse by, more deeper by proportional representation. You can't blame proportional representation or the electoral system. You can attach some blame, as we'll see, to the very extensive powers given to the president um, and uh, that included ruling by emergency decree. Okay, so economically, after the war, because Germany had borrowed huge sums of money to pay for the war, expecting to get this money back from, the, uh, uh, from a victory, from the victorious, uh, victory over the Allies, and of course they lost, and they had to pay. And governments were not willing to raise taxes, because that would have mean raising taxes to pay the French and the British and the Belgians, and that wasn't really on. And so hyperinflation ensued by the end of 1923. Inflation, and here's a 100 billion, 100 billion mark uh, note issued by a small town, because at that time uh, small towns had to issue emergency money. Uh, you, they couldn't print money quickly enough. You might go for a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee in the morning, uh, spend an hour in a cafe, and by the time you uh, got up to pay the wage, the price had doubled. People would collect their wages in banknotes and wheelbarrows and rush off to buy uh, bread before it uh, uh, became too expensive. So, huge economic crisis in 1923. And this uh, caused political mayhem. The uh, hyperinflation... Uh, led to rapid uh, unemployment. Government wouldn't control it. They couldn't pay reparations to the French, that the French invaded and occupied Germany's major industrial area, the Ruhr in the west of Germany. Uh, there was passive resistance. And in this atmosphere, uh, Hitler decided that the, uh, that the Republic was collapsing and he would stage a coup d'etat. So let's have the next. There's Hitler, uh, Goering, Streicher, and various other people marching from the beer hall across the river into the center of Munich with the expectation of taking over the government Munich, of Munich and then marching on Berlin. But uh, he hadn't um, squared this with the government in Munich, obviously, though he thought he had, with the police, with the army, uh, with the uh, business community, uh, and it was a miserable uh, failure. When he got to the town hall, he was fired on by the police and a hail of bullets. Uh, he uh, dislocated an arm in the, in the Malay. Um, some Nazis were killed, and uh, it, it uh, was uh, the, the beer hall putsch didn't get them anywhere at all. Hitler didn't make the same mistake again. Ten years later, he made sure that he had the support of the army and the business community, uh, the conservative elites and uh, civil service uh, and the police before he seized power. That was one lesson he learned. We put another slide up. Um, the, uh, that one lesson he learned. But the, uh, another one was that, the, uh, that a, a, a violent seizure of power, full frontal assault, was not going to work. Uh, he had to choose other means. And he chose the means of going through the ballot box, of getting support in elections, and switched his tactics to then. Here you can see, uh, it's been argued in economic terms that the Weimar Republic survived this hyperinflation crisis. And indeed it did. Hitler was in jail. The Nazi party was effectively out of action. Uh, the Republic solved the inflation crisis. And from 1924 to 1929, it was relatively economically and politically stable, so-called golden age of Weimar. So let's have the next slide. Now, in 1929, however, a new, a major new economic crisis, much, much worse, happened. It's worth remembering that in 1928, the Nazis... Uh, only scored 2.8% of the vote in a national election. They didn't get anywhere until the Great Depression. The Depression, the Wall Street crash in 1929, led to American banks 
withdrawing their loans from German banks who withdraw their, withdrew their loans from German business. Business collapsed. Before long, by the summer of 1932, the uh, German economy was in a state of absolute collapse. Much, much worse than the year 2008, which we've experienced. There was uh, at least 35% unemployment, probably near 40%. Uh, so uh, in this situation, the uh, coalition government in power, which is led by the Social Democrats, a moderate left-wing party, uh, collapsed. The different groups in the coalition could not agree. Was it going to be deflation? Was it going to be job creation? How are they going to solve the problem? And a politician called Heinrich Brüning, who was a conservative politician, was put in power uh, by the president. The president was uh, Hindenburg. He was a general, a field marshal from the First World War. Uh, and he installed Brüning and his party, the centre party, in power. Now, from 19... 29, 19, uh, onwards, really Germany was ruled by emergency decree issued in the name of the president, who was an elderly figure, not terribly effective, uh, but had this constitutional power. And the president uh, gave this power, first of all, to Brüning, who was head of the government for a couple of years. But Brüning, as you can see there, a colorless, unappealing figure, on the left, and it's an election post, uh, poster. Uh, and in this period, uh, Brinning's appeal in the elections that ensued in 1930 and 1932 was simply uh, back to Brinning, it says. Let's not have any fratricide. Let's have order. Let's have uh, work and bread. On the right, it's even more defensive. There you've got the two horde on the left, a red flag of the communists on the right, the fl a red flag of the swastika of the, of the Nazis. It says, Brüning, the last bastion of freedom and order. So vote for the center party, his, his party. Uh, Brüning wasn't exactly a friend of democracy. Uh, he was a, uh, what you might call a kind of expert, government of experts, financial experts at the next slide. Uh, and in 19... 30, there were national elections. And to everyone's shock, the Nazi party, you can see there the brown bit of the pie chart, uh, scored a very, scored a major victory. They came from nowhere, 2.8%, uh, to get a very large slice of the vote. And uh, that's really a direct uh, consequence of the of the. Great Depression, the universal economic collapse. So you can see economic depression does have a corrosive effect on, on, on democracies. Uh, it made people disillusioned. They were already, uh, they, they'd been reconciled to the Republic by 1930, but now with unemployment showing no signs of, uh, of um, declining, business collapses everywhere, the middle classes began to get frightened as the unemployed flocked to the Communist Party. As you can see there in the bright red, they began to, uh, the Communist Party was the only party that increased its vote in every election uh, in 1930 and 1932. By 1932, it had 100 seats in the national legislature. And what they promised, what they promised was a, uh, a socialist, a, a, a Soviet Germany. This is the time of, early time of Stalin, uh, in power in the Soviet Russia. They were completely in his hands uh, and they wanted, they threatened to do for Germany what the, the Bolsheviks had done in Russia. So no wonder the middle classes were scared, even quite a few social democrats. They'd seen what happened to the Mensheviks, they'd seen what had happened with mass imprisonments, uh, murders uh, in, in Soviet Russia. So they began to flock to the Nazi party. Let's have the next slide. Uh, now, the Nazi party entered the presidential election. Hindenburg, was every seven years, the uh, elections were held for the post of president. And one of the sources of the president's power was, as in the United States or in France, the president was elected independently. It was a, a, an independent election, uh, not as it is in Germany now, uh, by the members of the, of the national legislature. 
uh, not by members of parliament. And there's the two leading figures were Hindenburg there, the old uh, field marshal, uh, who's uh, calling for unity and social peace, and Hitler looking very dynamic there. We're going to take this fate of the nation into our hands. And uh, all the other parties, in the end, lined up behind Hindenburg. Hitler was defeated, but he did get a huge uh, uh, chunk of the votes. Hindenburg get, got 53%. Hitler got 37% of the vote. Hindenburg wasn't very happy uh, about uh, Brüning's relatively lukewarm support for him, although Brüning didn't at all like Hitler. There was a Catholic Center Party candidate who was eliminated in an earlier round. So let's have another slide, please. Uh, and so he replaced him with this figure, a very traditional-looking chap, Franz von Papen, a German aristocrat, who is a friend of, Hitler, of Hindenburg's circle. <coughs> and von Papen uh, wanted, this is very symbolic, wearing the, uh, the spiked helmet. Papen really wanted to turn the clock back to the days of the Kaiser. He and his ultra-conservative nationalist political allies uh, thought that the Republic was in a mess. It had failed to restore German greatness. It had not succeeded in getting rid of the Treaty of Versailles, rearming Germany. Uh, it was still paying reparations, uh, though these uh, were negotiated. These managed to come to an end in 1932. Uh, they suspended and then, and then, uh, uh, and then stopped. But uh, there's an economic crisis was still ongoing. And it was uh, the people now, not because some uh, people now are thinking, this is enough. Middle class people in particular, uh, if we don't do something radical, uh, we will fall prey to the communists. So let's have the next slide. Um, and so in, uh, Poppen began in the summer of 1932 by staging a little kind of coup d'etat in Prussia. Now, Prussia was the largest state in this federal system, and it was run by the Social Democrats, moderate socialists, who had the backing of the trade unions and wanted to uh, carry out social reforms in Germany. And uh, Papen realized that they were a major obstacle in the way of his turning the clock back to the days of the Kaiser. So he got uh, troops to storm here, the socialist headquarters, uh, and began to rule directly from Berlin when the socialists were ousted. The next slide. Now, here you can see the problem, the problem of Papen and his nationalist allies was that they didn't have much popular support. Their voters had, <coughs> had deserted them for the, um, for the Nazis. And there's the Nazi party getting bigger and bigger in every election. Uh, and uh, now the March 1933 election, you can sort of ignore that because they, uh, that was when they were already beginning to establish a dictatorship. And what's interesting about this, you can see in the election of July 1932 to November 1932, uh, the Nazi party actually lost votes at the big column at the top. It, it goes down a bit. They were the first signs of an economic recovery. More importantly, the Nazi party, who depended on, uh, for their income on subscriptions from members and donations from small business, uh, they were not, and some people have argued, supported by big business, who just sort of hedged their bets and gave money to several different political parties. Um, but they were running out of money. They weren't able to campaign uh, terribly well. So uh, they looked as if they were weakening. And the top party organizer called Gregor Strasser uh, resigned his post because Hitler, despite Papen approaching him, would he join a government that would give Papen mass support for his plans to turn the clock back? Hitler said, no, I won't become a member of any government unless I'm the leader. Because he'd established this idea of the leadership principle. He was the leader, the Führer in German. He mustn't have anybody above him, either in the party or in the, uh, in, in the government. And there was a kind of blockage, a kind of, kind of stalemate. Um, now, the Nazis' biggest vote in July, 13.7 million votes, the largest party. If you uh, look at the November elections, however, 
uh, they've got 13.1 um, million votes. They're down. And the two left-wing parties, the Socialists and the Communists between them, actually got more votes than the Nazis. So Nazis didn't come to power on a wave of overwhelming popular support. 37% um, was the highest ever. And that's really very interesting when you compare that with the strong men of the present day. If you look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, or Recep Tayyip Erdogan in, in uh, Turkey, they have the support of the majority of the population. Uh, they're not uh, constricted to a minority uh, as the Nazis were. And that's a very significant difference, which I think is very, very disturbing. Uh, still in Germany, at the height of the Nazis' electoral success, uh, they still fail to get more than just over a third of the, of the popular vote. So, so the next slide. Now here's their propaganda. You can see there, we're going to have reconstruction. We're building up our bricks, our work, freedom and bread, a vote. And then the, you know, the building, the other ones are all, all, the other parties are all corrupt. You've got the giant worker personifying the German people. Uh, everyone else, they're all pygmy, pygmies. On the right, again, workers uh, awake. And there you have them threatening the caricature, allegedly Jewish leaders of the other parties. It's completely complete myth. The other parties were not led by Jews at all. Let's have another slide uh, very quickly. But by this time, Weimar Republic had lost its, uh, lost its legitimacy. The violence of these electoral posters is extraordinary. Here you have the Social Democrats. They're a democratic party, but you've got the same giant worker smashing the, the swastika, pushing the communists to one side. Let's have another slide. Now, Parfen having failed to get the Nazis to provide popular support for him, was pushed aside by Hindenburg and his group, the president, and uh, they appointed a spokesperson for the army, General Kurt von Schleicher. So they thought, get the army, even if it was small, 100,000 men, it was relatively well equipped. You couldn't have tanks, but they had machine guns and, uh, and, and other weapons. And Schleicher had a go at bringing Hitler and the Nazis in. Now, let's have another slide. Uh, he thought that, um, with Papen, uh, that um, turning the clock back to the Kaiser's time, renegotiating the Treaty of Versailles, using that as a launch pad, get the territories back, uh, and in fact, have a war, carry on, resume the World War I to establish uh, territory, get more territory in, in the East. And they... Uh, Brought. They thought the Nazis were weak, they'd lost votes, and so with Hindenburg they negotiated a deal. Here you have a contemporary cartoon. Pop and Hindenburg uh, are shouldering Hitler, bringing him into power. This is the next slide. Because what they did on the 30th of January 1933 was to set up a coalition government with Hitler, what he wanted, as its head. He was the Reich Chancellor. And a few others, you can see them, a small figure of Joseph Goebbels, a propagandist there, Hermann Goering in uniform, and uh, Wilhelm Frick, also in uniform. They're just uh, four Nazis. All the others in the cabinet were conservative politicians. They were backward-looking. The Nazis were conservative revolutionaries. Their policies were much, much more radical than those of the conservatives. But uh, the Papen and his friends uh, thought they'd, they'd boxed him in. We've boxed him into a corner, said Papen, in one of the most uh, notoriously uh, uh, false statements of history. We boxed Hitler as a corner. We've got him where we want him. Uh, but this wasn't true at all. So this is the beginning. Let's have the next slide, please. What Hitler wanted, and the Nazis, was to establish a radical dictatorship. Uh, they didn't want to turn the clock back. They thought that the Kaiser and his regime had been uh, feeble. They'd lost the First World War. They hadn't been bold enough. Uh, they didn't want to bring the Kaiser back. They wanted a radical modern dictatorship. And they had a model. They had the model of Mussolini in Italy, who'd established a fascist regime in the 1920s eliminating all other political parties, uh, 
a glorifying Mussolini as the leader, El Duce. Uh, they'd uh, they'd um, reorganize society, started militarizing society. Hitler didn't want to renegotiate the Treaty of Versailles. He simply wanted to push it aside and ignore it. How did they manage then to convert this position of a small minority of ministers in a coalition government dominated by the conservatives in January to a one-party state, a one-party dictatorship in the summer, in about six months? Now that's the question. This is the real question about how Weimar democracy was eliminated. Well, well first of all, if chance came to their aid. On the 27th, 28th of February, 1933, the German parliament was set, a, set alight. It burned down. Here we have a picture of it burning. It was, in fact, uh, a, a lone Dutch, young Dutch anarcho-syndicalist called Marinus van der Lubbe, who was protesting against the treatment of the unemployed, and now are being, after all this time, are being deprived of benefits in Germany by the, the government. He'd already tried to burn down three public buildings in Berlin, including the town hall. But this time he was lucky with all the furnishings, uh, the, the, the uh, curtains, carpets, and so on, went off in a blaze. Now, um, the communists alleged that uh, Hitler himself had ordered the fire, but there's no evidence at all uh, of any convincing kind. It's just a, a chance. The Nazis, however, and to this day, no one's quite sure whether they really believe this or not, said this is the start-up to a communist revolution, a communist coup d'etat. After all, if you look back to 1917, uh, Lenin had come to power in a coup d'etat. Uh, they thought the communists in Germany were trying to do the same. And they got Hindenburg, you pass another uh, slide, please. They got uh, Hindenburg to pass an emergency decree. This uh, suspend uh, any, suspended all civil liberties. Uh, it uh, banned the left-wing press. Hundreds of communists were arrested. Before long, the Nazis uh, stormtroopers, uh, there, a couple of hundred thousand strong by now, were enrolled as uh, auxiliary police, at least in Prussia, were arresting communists left, right, and, and center. And that's another essential part of the seizure of power, which is often neglected. Mass violence on the streets, beatings, intimidations, and this creation of a new uh, unofficial kind of detention center, the concentration camp. Even in July, in the elections of July 1932, over 400 people were killed in street fighting between the Nazis, the communists, and other parties in, uh, in Germany. Uh, in the first few months of 1933, it's this mass violence and intimidation, uh, not just against the communists, but also against socialists and selected prominent members of other political parties, a violence and intimidation. Uh, between January and July 1933, the Nazis put nearly 200,000 people overwhelmingly communists and socialists into makeshift concentration camps. Let's have another slide. Uh, this is the kind of street violence that was going on day after day in the early 1930s. And this one realizes that this seizure of power happens on two levels, the formal legal electoral uh, official level and this level of violence and intimidation. Uh, you can't really realize uh, how they came to power. And that, of course, is a, a massive difference between the collapse of Weimar democracy and the collapse of democracies on our own time. It's not just that, uh, that there's a lot of public support for strong men. It's also that, at least until they come to power, uh, they don't, they, in, the, in our own time, use that kind of mass violence against their opponents on the streets. Uh, I haven't seen Donald Trump mobilizing a quarter of a million stormtroopers uh, to uh, maim, beat up, and kill his opponents. There's an edge of violence sometimes to his rhetoric, but, and it has done something to encourage some of his supporters to um, exercise violence, but that's on a tiny, tiny, minuscule scale compared to this mass violence of the Nazis. Let's have another, uh, another slide. 
if we got one. Now, as part of his deal to become chancellor, head of a coalition government, he'd extracted a promise of elections. So here we have elections of 1933. Now, these elections were not free elections. You've already had the whole of February pretty well uh, with stormtroopers running riot over Germany from the Reichstag fire. You had about a week, just over a week, um, between the Reichstag fire and here. So this is a situation in which communists were being arrested everywhere. Uh, socialists were being beaten up. Already, Hitler had managed to stop the uh, opposition parties by sheer terror from uh, campaigning properly. He allowed the communists to put candidates up because that would divide the left-wing opposition between the socialists and the communists. And here you have the results. With the Nazis campaigning, the other parties prevented largely from doing so, the Nazis still couldn't get an overall majority. The NSDAP, that's the Nazis, the kind of dark blue, uh, they only managed 44%, even under these conditions. Uh, the other parties uh, divided between the tells, particularly the two left-wing parties who hated each other almost as much as they hated the Nazis. Um, but they still, communists still managed, even under these conditions, to get a, a substantial number of, um, number of votes. So the next slide, please. Um, here's uh, first concentration camp has opened in an old munitions factory in March in uh, Dachau in Bavaria. Those are, those are all communists. Some socialists. Let's have another slide, please. Um, so there's all this violence going on. Now, Hitler needed to reassure the elites, and particularly Hindenburg, and so uh, he staged a famous uh, ceremony called uh, the Day of, of Potsdam. Uh, he um, uh, dressed in a frock coat and not in a uniform. Here's Hindenburg. Hindenburg here is greeting him in his field marshal's uniform. Uh, he uh, was um, on the 21st of March, 1933. Uh, this is the opening of the new Reichstag, which had to be held in an opera house, the, the Kroll Opera House, with a ceremony in which there was a vacant throne left, left vacant for the absent Kaiser, who was in exile in Holland, to reassure Papen, Hindenburg, the old elites, that he was... Uh, doing something to restore uh, the old system of the Kaiser. It's complete deception, of course. Uh, but this is a very grand propaganda event. And on the very next day, the um, Nazis closed down the uh, various um, uh, opposition uh, headquarters, including trade unions in May. Socialist headquarters were raided. Uh, they uh, they used violence on a massive scale. Now, on the 23rd of March, uh, 1933, they passed through the Reichstag, you put the next slide up, the Enabling Act. This basically uh, used all this violence, a lot of it caused by the Nazis, as an excuse for uh, a law which had to be passed because we're changing the constitution by the Reichstag by two-thirds majority. But the cabinet, according to this law, was able to pass laws without referring them to the Reichstag or the president. This is the legal, pseudo-legal, quasi-legal foundation of the dictatorship, along with the Reichstag fire decree, which both of these continued in operation to the end of the, end of, uh, the regime. So you can see here, emergency legislation is one way in which democracies can be destroyed. They may say it's an emergency, and then it's constantly renewed as a quasi-legal basis. And it's quite worrying that uh, some strong men talk about or even implement uh, an emergency decrees of one sort or another. This is done by intimidation. The communist deputies weren't allowed there. They're in prison or in exile. Uh, only the Catholic Center Party did a deal uh, to preserve its uh, institutions uh, in Germany. Uh, again, ignored later on by the Nazis. So the next slide. Um, and now comes the famous book burning. Nazi students and universities took all books by uh, left-wing authors and pacifists and burnt them publicly on the streets. Censorship is established. This is the next slide. Uh, and now from May, June, 
uh, very quickly, all non-Nazi organizations were merged into the Nazi party, even football clubs and uh, choirs and all sorts of other uh, regional governments were taken over. Opponents, let's have another slide, uh, were, uh, were, were crushed. Uh, the parties were forced by intimidation to uh, close, them, uh, close themselves down, to wind themselves up. And by July, you have, by the use of violence, backed by uh, legislation, um, including, for example, uh, uh, you have a one-party state, a dictatorship. A very good example is the law of the 7th of um, April, 1933, uh, for the reform of the civil service. Basically, if you were not a Nazi, then you were kicked out of the civil service. And this also includes jobs like school teachers, uh, lawyers, all kinds of other independent uh, positions. The, the press was taken over by the Nazi press. It happens very, very quickly. There's a postscript. A year later, Hindenburg was clearly dying, uh, and some of the conservatives, a bit dissatisfied by being outmaneuvered like this, uh, were planning to replace him with Papen. So Hitler staged an infamous Night of the Long Knives at the end of June, killing a number of uh, his more revolutionary followers, killing Schleicher, the former uh, president. Papen was kicked out to become ambassador to Austria. Uh, Hindenburg then died and Hitler declared himself uh, to be not president because he said Hindenburg had been so great he couldn't uh, be a success, have a successor, but the leader. After that, the whole constitutional uh, apparatus was left uh, behind and the, uh, the civil service and the army had to take a personal oath of allegiance to Hitler. So last slide coming up. Hindenburg's funeral. Let's have another slide. Maybe no more. That's it. So that's, uh, that's how it happened. So you can see there are similarities and differences. Democracy dies or is destroyed in a variety of different ways. Ultimately, I think the key difference here is the massive use of violence by the Nazis to intimidate and destroy the opposition. If you want to look at similarities, you can have uh, the degree of popular support the Nazis had, but it was never enough to achieve power by themselves, unlike in some other cases. You can look at the sophisticated propaganda uh, of the Nazis. You look, look at the contempt for parliamentary uh, and democratic institutions. Uh, we face serious threats to democracy in the world today, but I think we have to tackle them in their own terms, in our own time. In the end, uh, the 21st century is not seeing a repetition of the 1930s. The, um, fascism is not reappearing, and it's very important to realize this. The forms that populism take are quite different from those of the Nazis. Uh, thank you very much indeed. We will now open the house to questions. We have a, a roving mic, so if you raise your hand, um, okay. put it close to your mouth like I've had to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for a wonderful, uh, very stimulating talk. Uh, would you look at the kind of parallels that we have uh, in uh, India, which you've called the largest democracy in the world, uh, to, to the rise of the Nazi movement uh, in the sense of violence that we have, the kind of mob lynchings that have been going on, uh, in the past few years and the, you know, the, the, the very frightening populist uh, measures that have been taken. We've seen, not a, uh, we've seen uh, you know, censorship of films, we've seen censorship of books, we've seen books being, not being allowed to be taught in universities. And I talked in Delhi University for many years, so I do know what I'm talking about. I mean, the Academic Council has been sort of bullied into uh, uh, changing syllabi in history and literature and Right, so th thank you very much. Well, um, I think it's important to realize just how radical and extreme the Nazis were. It's often difficult when we're thinking of parallels to, to, to remember this. So I like to say, for example, in President Trump's rhetoric, he, there are certain echoes of fascism, but they're often rather faint. Um, and, and he can't put most of what he wants into, into effect. If you look at mob violence, uh, for example, in, in, in India, 
uh, as far as I know, this is not deliberately instigated by governments in order to intimidate their opponents. There are other, uh, there are, there are, there's obviously an element of encouragement, but there's, in, in the whole use of violence in Nazi Germany was not mob violence, it was, it was, mob, it was violence by heavily armed, uniformed stormtroopers against their opponents. Now that's rather of the difference. On the whole, in modern German history, there's been relatively little m mob violence. The Germans are fairly, if I can generalize, a fairly orderly, uh, disciplined people. And that kind of order and discipline was used by the Nazis uh, uh, through the stormtroopers to kill, intimidate, and imprison their opponents in concentration camps. Uh, as for censorship, and you have that in every country, uh, but the Nazi censorship was absolutely extreme. Any kind of opposition. The laws were passed in July and August 1933 that made it um, a treasonable crime, uh, punishable by death, for example, simply to criticize the government. Uh, film criticism was banned in Nazi Germany because all the films were sanctioned by the regime. So criticizing a film meant you were criticizing a regime. This is very, it goes into every, every part of life. So the next question. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, gentle, gentleman in the white. Excuse me. There, yes, here. We've got a mic. Oh, you got a mic here. you got a mic. So what do you want to do? Over there, then. Hi. I can't, it's difficult to see. Hi. Oh, yeah. you got a mic. Oh, yes. OK, yeah. you got the mic's there. I'll come to you next. Uh, so my question is basically, uh, during the whole uh, rise of the Nazi, how were they able to, uh, you know, bring up the economy of Germany. As you see that, as you told, the economy was very bad. How were they able to bring it up during the time? Uh, so how did the Nazis bring about economic recovery? Yeah. Well, um, they, made the, they made a big propaganda uh, about uh, economic recovery, job creation schemes, building the autobahns, the big, the big highways across Germany. Um, but uh, that didn't soak up many jobs, really. Uh, there was uh, a lot of statistical manipulation, changing the definition of unemployment and so on. Um, but the real way in which they did it was through rearmament through from 1935. They reintroduced conscription. So that takes like two million young men off the labor market. You've got massive building programs for tanks, combat aircraft, ships, all of this kind of stuff, ammunitions and so on. Uh, that's really how unemployment was solved. And of course, then you have to look a little bit further. And in the end, their aim, and they did aim to have a European war of conquest, uh, of course, destroyed Germany in the end. It's quite different, very different from the New Deal in, uh, in, in America with Roosevelt. Let's have a question. Can I have a question from this side? Yeah, hello. Uh, if I could ask um, um, yeah. about the, the history of uh, German uh, <laughs> constitution, I believe, started under Bismarck, and he intentionally created an imperfect constitution so that he could retain power. Do you think the lack of a working democracy from, say, the 1880s is part of the reason why Germany fell to the Hitler push? The second totally different, very quick question is, when was the first attempt to, un, un, to get rid of Hitler? Was there any attempt, really, to get rid of him before the Second World War? Uh, thank you. Well, um, how far back in German history can you look? I think the key thing is that where the roots of democracy, of democratic, civic culture are relatively shadow, uh, shallow, then uh, it does, democracy doesn't have a deep-rooted, long tradition, uh, then it is much easier to get rid of. You can see this in Eastern Europe in the present day, where most regimes in Eastern Europe, uh, most countries in Eastern Europe uh, were... Uh, did not live under a democratic regime from 1949 uh, until 1989 under communism. And before that, uh, I think only Czechoslovakia was a, a democracy. In the other countries, Poland was a military, under military rule. And you can go around the wall and see that uh, it takes a long time for democratic institutions to root themselves in the culture, which I think uh, as they have done in India, uh, but the many Eastern European countries, they have not. And that's we're seeing the fruits of that. Um, so that's, the, I mean, Bismarck, the unification of Germany, um, there were political parties. There was a relative freedom of the press, sometimes not so great, uh, but relative freedom of the press. Uh, political parties campaigned, but there's no governmental responsibility. In other words, ministers are appointed by the Kaiser. Uh, 
And Kaiser's power was wielded by Bismarck. Kaiser Wilhelm II famously said, it's really tough being Kaiser under Bismarck. Um, but those powers then accrued to Hindenburg. Many of them did. They kind of made Hindenburg a kind of the president of the Weimar Republic, uh, like a continuation of the Kaiser's position. I think that was a very bad mistake. Yeah. Next question. You, you, you just pick them. Yeah. If you look at uh, Nazism as a model, a point of reference, the easy, the ready use of the term fascist, semi-fascist, fascistic, and so on, uh, the implication is don't do it. Is that, what you, is that the message you're, you're conveying? Don't uh, idly or easily, readily use Yes, term yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's a very good point. So um, it's what you might call conceptual inflation. So uh, the word fascist then gets applied to almost anybody whose politics you, you dislike. Um, and I think that is dangerous because it prevents us from recognizing the realities about present day uh, far right extreme nationalist, uh, nationalist politics. There are genuine fascist movements about. I think the Golden Dawn movement in Greece, for example, is, is a genuine fascist because it uh, uses, uh, relies heavily on violence, on, on violence, physical violence against its opponents. And that seems to me one of the key elements in fascism. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about um, whether you subscribe more to the um, intentionalist or structuralist side of the historiography historiographical debate about whether Hitler was an unprincipled opportunist um, who kind of went along as the circumstances pushed his way through and he kind of exploited the situation or whether he was a fanatical visionary who had like, consistently pursued his... Okay, this is a question about how Hitler ran uh, Nazi Germany, how he ran the First Reich, how decisions were made, in other words. And some historians have said, well, look at him, he got up, you know, he, he's pretty lazy in some ways. He got up very late in the morning, uh, stayed watching old movies since the middle of the night. He didn't work in a systematic manner at all. He wasn't a pen pusher. Uh, he believed in an informal structure of rule. He intended to let people get on with, get on with it. He's, unlike Stalin, he, who's, who, had to, who, who eliminated most of his uh, senior ministers because they'd been there before him, uh, Hitler's senior officers, senior ministers, actually had come into power with him. Uh, and so he kept them all, even if they were quite incompetent, as say Goering became. Um, and so therefore, people had to guess what Hitler wanted, because he wasn't micromanaged. And they always guessed the most radical uh, national uh, Nazi policy. Um, now, I think that's a problem with, with, with that, is that Hitler did actually, you couldn't do anything Hitler didn't want to do. Uh, and you, he did actually control uh, policy. He wasn't interested so much in the economy. He said, just get on with it, he said to the economic people. Um, but he was very interested in foreign policy. He controlled that. Uh, wasn't, uh, he was interested in, in uh, policies against his bugbear, the Jews, his sort of rabid, uh, paranoid anti-Semite. Anti he ran that. So you have to look at different areas and see, in some ways, uh, he, was, uh, he was intervened and controlled things in others that he... He didn't, I think, is the answer. And I forgot to answer this gentleman's question about attempts to get rid of Hitler. So, um, well, uh, there was a... The problem was that the people who were in a position to assassinate or remove Hitler agreed with quite a large chunk of what he was doing, not all of it. Uh, they only came bit by bit to realize that he was far more radical uh, than they had imagined. So it took until 1940, the 1940s, until the war, uh, before they began to attempt to uh, remove him, all culminating in the attempt to blow him up on 20th of July 1944. There were individuals, famously Georg Elzer, carpenter, um, uh, planted a bomb where he was due to speak. Uh, May manufactured and planted it in 1939 in September. Um, but Hitler left the, the stage before the bomb went off. But on the whole, the people who really opposed him, socialists and communists and some liberals, uh, were not in a position to do this. It was the army officers who eventually tried to get rid of him because they could, they could keep their plots, their conspiracies, secret. Whereas the socialists and the communists could, could not do that. They were penetrated very quickly by the Gestapo. Uh, One last question. Yeah. 
considering uh, the present scenario, what do you think can be the triggers for something like the Reich in the future? Will it be like unemployment, radical religion, concentration of wealth, automation, robotics, something that would lead to the emergence of something like the Reich phenomena? Can it occur? Can it, there be a trigger? What do you think? Um, so, is that a question about the future? Yeah. yeah. What do you think can... What's the major de threat to democracy? Is that it? Yeah. We basically, what do you think can a phenomenon like the Reich happen again? Like, what can be a trigger in the future? Like, you think some phenomena that is happening yeah. might snowball into something like the Third Reich? Well, um, I'm a historian, so I write about the past. And um, I, I've always avoided answering questions, I'm afraid, about the future. Ever since in 1989, I wrote a, a short book that said that German reunification would never happen in my lifetime. So, <laughs> if you'll excuse me. Thank you. We wish to thank Richard Evans. Ivan would be signing his book at the book signing area next to Darbar Hall. Thank you. Next session begins at 12.30, the fog, the smog and the flu. Thank you.